Hello and welcome to RGU Talk, the official podcast of Robert Gordon University. I'm your host, Johnny Milne, and this week we are looking at the power that a simple photograph can have. I'm delighted to be joined by senior lecturer from RGU's School of Applied Social Studies. It's Neil Gibson. Neil, welcome to RGU Talk. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Well, now, as I said, you're a senior lecturer at the university, but also the course leader for the BA on social work. That's right, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. What does that, for anyone that might not know, what does that typically make a day in your life like? <sighs> well, it's as predictable as social work was. It's <laughs> so difficult to define a typical day. I mean, I guess I've got the view of the social work course that we deliver to the undergraduate students. Um, it's a four-year course. So um, from the first year modules right through to the fourth year dissertation, oh, I've wow, got to okay. have a handle on all the modules. Uh, fortunately, I've got a fantastic team that work in the department as well, uh, four brilliant year tutors and then a, a, a team to draw upon for teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you've got the students, which are bring issues, but also delightful to work with as well. I'm so glad you ended on the, the, the good thing, the delightfulness. <laughs> the positive, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we're here today to talk about what is in my opinion, a fascinating tool for social workers that you've dedicated years of research to, therapeutic photography. Yeah. So first of all, what exactly is therapeutic <laughs> photography? Yeah, I've dedicated about five years of my life so far to, to trying to come up with a, a proper definition of what it is. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's around about using photographs as a communication tool to facilitate uh, discussion and engagement with people who are typically hard to reach in social work. Okay. Um, and what I do is I put the control in the hands of the people I'm working with so that they actually define the issues for themselves through, photo uh, through using photographs. And then we use those photographs as a basis for discussion, hence therapeutic photography. And what made you decide to make this such a focal point of your work? Well, when I was first thinking about doing a bit of research when I first came to RGU, uh, I had the idea of doing a PhD mm -hmm. and somebody, I can't remember who it was, but I need to thank them, said to me that if you're going to do a PhD, pick something that you're passionate about, pick something that you're genuinely interested in because spending five years of your life looking at this area, you're going to have to be interested in mm -hmm. it. So I was thinking about things that I was genuinely keen on and one thing I was doing at the time was I was taking a photograph every day. Just one photograph a day and uploading it to Flickr. And I didn't know why I was doing this. It was fun. And I did this for a year. And then I looked back in the photographs and I really enjoyed looking at my own images mm -hmm. about what, I, what I'd taken over the past year. It's like a photo diary. And I got to thinking, is there some kind of benefit to doing this? And that's when I started reading about using photography in a therapeutic setting. Mm -hmm. And I came across two different practices. Photo voice, no, sorry, photo therapy and therapeutic photography. Okay. Now, phototherapy is where therapists and counsellors use photographs, but therapeutic photography is more relaxed and unstructured. Okay. And, um, I mean, when I, uh, before interviewing you, I spoke to um, Fergus Connor, who's one of the uh, technicians, former lecturer in Grace School of Art, who said to me that he likes photography. He thinks the camera is so special because it, well, first of all, it never lies but it also offers you any number of creative perspectives to be as direct or as complex as you want with your story. But in your mind, from using this from a therapeutic point of view, what is it about photography that makes it so useful in a social work setting? There's so many strands, I think, to why it's so useful. But first and foremost, everybody practically everybody nowadays has a telephone in their pocket with the ability to take photographs. It's so accessible and especially the younger generation now are using photographs on a daily basis to communicate through apps like Snapchat and mm -hmm. uh, Instagram. So it's so accessible. Also you don't need special skills to be a photographer. You can point and shoot and capture an image and it's something that you've created, you've chosen, you've 
pinpointed something to photograph and you've created something from that. So instantly you've produced something. You, you're, you can tell yourself that you're good at producing something mm. because you've done it. And then you can explain to somebody why you took that photograph, what, what it was that appealed to you. So there's so many elements of power and control in looking for an image, choosing to photograph it, capturing it, showing it and talking about it. And in social work, that's quite empowering for the people we work with because it puts the control firmly in their hands. And if you imagine being sort of really disempowered, coming into contact with social work and really not wanting to have contact with social work okay. and not knowing why you've got contact, to change the dynamic and give that person a bit of power and control in that relationship is extremely beneficial for them. Of course, absolutely. It's one of these things you, that you almost don't... If you're, if you're not involved in that kind of sphere you mm -hmm. don't think about it yeah um i know you've used this technique you've introduced it to a number of groups that you have worked with in recent years when it comes to encouraging this uh, empowering self exploration exploration sorry what kind of themes and tasks do you give the people that you've tried this with well, that was one of the areas I had to look at for my research because what I discovered was that people were doing this in practice, but it was very unstructured. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to find a way that some structure could be given. So I developed a six-week program to work with people uh, using therapeutic photography. And how it begins is really just a bit of self-exploration. So looking at why, what photographs mean to you, why they're important to you, but then also how you represent yourself in a photograph and what positive characteristics you can capture in okay. a photograph. So we get quite abstract quite quickly because obviously it's quite difficult to capture a positive quality or characteristic of yourself. Mm -hmm. So you have to think a bit creatively. So it starts to push the boundaries quite quickly. And then we build on that to look at significant relationships in people's lives and how they can represent those, explore, exploring emotions. And then we start to look at storytelling. So can you use photographs to show what a day in your life might be like using eight photographs? Okay. And we build on that. We do some exploration around society and the environment, what you like, what you don't like. And it all ends with a photo project. So usually I work with groups and I ask them to select a theme to work around for the final two weeks of the program where they will go out and collect images on a specific theme. So there's so many different groups have come up with so many different ideas. I was working with an autistic group of adults and they chose to explore the superpowers of autism. So they okay. thought it's not all bad. There are yeah. some good things about having autism. So they wanted to explore that through photographs. And then a mental health group I worked with wanted to explore the concept of my safe space. So where they find safety and what threatens that. So it's really fascinating working with these groups because by the end of the six weeks, they choose the themes, they choose the project, and they mm -hmm. come back with the photographs, and they, they educate me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's really enlightening and empowering for them. And I like that you can, like, through this technique, you know, the social worker and the people that they're working with, yeah, learn from each other. Absolutely. Um, so what kinds of feedback have you had from groups or individuals that you've used this with? Every group I've worked with has really enjoyed participating in it. I think mixed receptions to start off with because they're not really sure what therapeutic photography is. Some okay. thought they were coming to learn photography. Some thought they were coming for deep and meaningful therapy, which scared them. Mm -hmm. But when they found out that it was more about exploring issues in a group in safety with visuals, it freed people up and there was so much conversation, quite a lot of self-disclosure, but the group managed that really well. Um, so yeah, that was that was fascinating. Um, every group was so different in terms of what they then went on to explore. What I found was that what brought the groups together was not necessarily what they wanted to explore. So if I had a substance use group, they weren't going to explore the issues of substance use. Mm -hmm. It was more about their own identities. Same with carers. Caring was a small aspect of their identity they wanted to explore other avenues of their identity okay. and the only negative criticism I received was that the course was too short they didn't like the fact it was only six weeks they it's wanted to continue negative. which was great yeah. yeah um well you've obviously you've not just looked at uh, therapeutic photography at a local level but you have taken this expertise out across the world um You've mentioned to me before about your time using this in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that on this? 
Sure, yeah. Uh, myself and a colleague, Professor Stephen Vertigans, uh, went out to Nairobi and we worked in an informal settlement called Kibera. Um, now, some might call it a slum, but I was told by the people who live there that only they can call it a slum. Okay. They own that word, which I totally respected. So it was an informal settlement set up on the, well, really in the city centre of Nairobi. What we were doing there was we were exploring resilience because we were coming up to a time where there was a general election in Kenya. And 10 years prior to that, there had been immense violence, many deaths. And we were investigating what it felt like to be living through a period of uncertainty, potential turmoil um, in the political scheme. And we wanted to use the therapeutic photography program to elicit some information mm -hmm. from the groups we were working with. So we went over and we did some training in the therapeutic photography program. And it bowled me over how quickly and how enthusiastically people responded um, in in, um, in Kibera. Mm -hmm. And then we worked with them to gather information and data on the theme of resilience and found some fantastic results around about what what strengthened resilience and what threatened resilience when living in um, an informal settlement. And um, what kind of, uh, th obviously it's hard, this is not a visual kind of podcast, but what kind of results were you getting from that? What kind of things were they um, choosing to focus on? It's kind of a, a bit of a generalisation, but what we found was that Overwhelmingly, the images were positive. Okay. So people were focusing on what strengthened resilience. And what we were seeing were th was the strong importance of family, but also the community. Mm -hmm. um, many of the participants were telling us that if you went to bed hungry and your neighbour had food, then they were going to come around and feed you. Mm -hmm. you just It was unheard of to to not think of your neighbours and they they were exploring this concept with us and I was saying in Scotland that's quite different and perhaps we've lost this sense of community so that was that was a strong sense of of the importance of community but also entrepreneurialship um, fixing problems from within so not having people come from the outside to say right you know your life's a mess this is what you do mm -hmm. they were saying no we've got the answers, we've got the entrepreneurial spirit, we might need a bit of help to get that off the ground, but that's what we want. So can you facilitate us to, or support us to you know, spread the word and, and create skills from within rather than from without? And the things that threaten resilience were, as we expected, the sort of political scene, um, the, I would say, suspicion of politics. 10 okay. years ago, they were saying very much that they were engaged in the political process. But since then, they'd realised that politicians were using them to, for their own gains, and they hadn't seen a politician in Kibera for the 10-year period. Right, okay. And therefore, you know, why trust this person who's coming in now asking for more votes? So there was a real deep suspicion of politics. And I think, therefore, they were drawing strengths from within the community rather than trying to look for support out with the community. Okay. Um, well, all of these experiences, uh, your experiences with therapeutic photography, have all fed in very well to your cheap plug coming, your newly released book. Very good. Therapeutic Photography by Neil Gibson, which released in late August. For people listening, who is the book aimed at and what do you hope makes it stand out from any uh, other books on the market in this area? It's aimed at a wide variety of people. Clearly, my research was from a social work perspective. But what I quickly found was that this technique has applicability across a huge number of disciplines. Uh, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, other health-based professions, education as well. Mm -hmm. um, but also people who are working in counselling and therapy as well. I'm not saying that this usurps the practice of phototherapy because that is a different discipline. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are techniques that do cross over. Um, it's also aimed at anybody working in caring professions who might be interested in developing a new technique to work with people that they work for. Um, and what I do is I present some of the theory around the exercises, but I also present case examples as well. So it's quite easy for the reader to see, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying about that example. I can mm -hmm. see how that, that makes sense. And I also present a whole case study there as well. So this 
to my knowledge, is the only book in the market that addresses the issue of therapeutic photography. Other books look at phototherapy, but this is for people who aren't trained as counsellors mm-hmm. or trained as therapists, but who want to use an intervention and have some structure to that and some guidance for that. Well, you heard it here first, the therapeutic photography by Neil Gibson. But, Neil, on a completely left turn tangent you have had in in preparation for this uh, interview as looking up some of your history you've had such a <laughs> varied career you've worked in a bank mm-hmm. you've managed a youth hostel mm-hmm. drove tour buses yep you've worked on a sheep farm mm-hmm. and presented a travel program on channel 4 yep uh, well first <laughs> of all that is so diverse but why then after all that why turn to social work Hmm. I think a lot of this was curiosity. So I jumped from job to job because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I suppose in my late 20s, I finally realised that what I enjoyed most out of all these careers was two things. Working with people, but also problem solving. I really enjoyed the problem solving elements of everything I did. And I, at the time, there were, there were loads of jobs in social work. You know, you picked up the paper on a Monday and there was just social work jobs galore. Yeah. I thought, oh, okay. I, so I looked into this a bit more. I, my dad was a social worker. He's now retired. But he refused to tell me about social work. He said, no, go and speak to one of my colleagues. I don't want to, to mm. influence you. So I sought some guidance from um, a, a male social worker who was working in children's services in Aberdeen. And... I was enthused by what I heard. I just, this is, sounds like a fantastic profession. So it was at that point I applied to RGU and mm-hmm. came here on the postgraduate course to, to retrain in social work um, and never looked back. Really enjoyed my career in social work. Ended up working in the hospital and then went to work in criminal justice uh, substance use okay. uh, team. And then I was working in adult support and protection. So quite varied again. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the job came up here at RGU and I knew I'd wanted to go back into education to work and to do a bit of research. So I thought I'll put in an application and ended up getting it. And actually I've been here for coming for eight years now. And that's oh, the wow, longest okay. time I've been in any job. So well, something mm, must be attracting yeah, me. Yeah, long way that here, continue. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, hopefully your, your answer to this next question is not going to be leaving. But <laughs> what what is next for you? Good question. I, I've come to the end of my PhD, so okay. that's, that's finished, and I'm really pleased that the book is out now, but I don't want to leave therapeutic photography behind. Mm-hmm. I think there's so much more in the field of therapeutic photography that needs to be studied. Uh, I'd quite like to look at what are the supervisory needs of people practicing in therapeutic photography, but I'd also like to do some projects looking at the one-to-one works, because my my work was around about group work with therapeutic photography. I'd like to look at how this can be developed for one-to-one work. Well, I look forward to seeing what happens next then. But on that, Neil, thank you so much for coming and chatting with me today. No problem, thank you. And that's it for another episode of RGU Talk. On behalf of the University, I've been Johnny Milne, and we'll talk to you later.